And so I was very pleased to be asked to introduce Robert, uh, who's speaking to a very important topic uh, on questions of, of wildlife, bushmeat, and biodiversity uh, in tropical forests and the contributions that, uh, that uh, wildlife, uh, uh, small animals, fish, and so on make to forest-based livelihoods. And a whole host of issues arising with respect to <clears throat> the protection of these resources, their importance in the forest ecology, and their, and their importance to livelihoods and income. So, Robert, with that, uh, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm quite impressed to be sitting uh, on this part of seeing some sort of dark shape in, in, the, in the background. Um, why, why bushmeat? Uh, you, you may ask the question. I mean, sort of, so after all, we are the, the Center for International Forestry Research. Why, why do we work on the question of wildlife hunted for food? Uh, because it, it has a, a lot of repercussion in terms of the dynamics of the forest. 70% uh, of the species in tropical forests are disseminated by animals. Uh, a large number of the same species are, they see they are predated by animals. These are the same animals that people hunt for food or for the uh, purpose. So changing the the wildlife composition in a, in a given forest stand is changing the dynamic of the forest, as can be changing on the long term, the carbon stock can be changing the forest to something else. And th this has been described in 1982 by, by uh, Ken Redford as the empty forest syndrome. So you have a forest that, that is still with a lot of trees. If you look at it by remote sensing, you still see a forest inside it's empty. There is no animal and, and then the forest is more or less doomed to change. How it is going to change is not yet sure, but we have some hints that shows that it's going to change the balance in terms of uh, fast-growing species, uh, slow-growing species, carbon-rich species, carbon, less carbon-rich species in terms of um, trees. So the, 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 there is an, a significant ecological impact uh, on, on the wildlife. There is also a more crucial impact uh, it's the loss of biodiversity, and that's clearly how the, the issue of bushmeat or hunting for wildlife or food has been presented for decades. I mean, that's fundamentally we are extirpating species. Uh, in place like, like Ghana, uh, anything that is bigger than five kilo has disappeared. So what you are left with is the rats and equivalents uh, in the forest. So we are seeing a, a biodiversity crisis. The problem with this uh, biodiversity crisis approach is that it has very little traction uh, with the local people uh, at any level, from the villager to, to the ministers or, or the, 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 the president. Because fundamentally, uh, it is seen as a problem of the north. I mean, th these are these people in, in developed countries that tell us you need to protect, you need to stop hunting, but what, what's the purpose? The forest has always been there, the, the food has always been there. And, and we need that. And, and I, I think that's what we have tried, or we are still trying to do in, in our Bushmeat Research Initiative in C4, is to try to look at various angles, not only the conservation one in terms of this, this Bushmeat question. And I'm going to illustrate that in, uh, specifically with the Congo Basin, because it's the place I know, I know best, and, and that's the place where the, the various issues um, converge quite nicely, if I could say. Uh, Congo Basin, six countries, Cameroon, Gabon, uh, the two Congos, Equatorial Guinea, Central African Republic. That's about 100 million people, 70 million are in DRC and the rest is scattered in 25 million in Cameroon and after it's mainly very low population country. Gabon is 1.5 million, Congo 3 million, uh, Equatorial Guinea less than 1 million. So a lot of forest, the second largest block of rainforest uh, in the world. Uh, the second largest block of dry forest also in the world with the, with the Miombo. So it's, it's quite an important area and uh, it's also an area where uh, a lot of the people derive between 40 to 60 percent of their protein from wildlife, fish or, or bushmeat. And, and the size of the bushmeat issue in the Congo Basin is quite staggering. It's 5 million tons per year of animal extracted for food. Five million tons, just to give you an idea, it's about 
80% of the overall beef production of the European Commission countries. And we do have a problem when you look only at the local level and at the consumption level and addressing that from the conservation purpose. You should stop hunting. Well, fine, let's stop hunting, but who is going to produce 5 million tons of beef or equivalent to feed the people in the Congo Basin? People that are already below the World Health uh, Organization minimum in terms of protein intakes. So you reduce something that is already below. And uh, as of today, I mean, there is no substitution. We cannot replace these 5 million tons. We cannot simply say, people, you should stop hunting or you should stop eating meat. So we should try to manage uh, these resources. And that's something that nobody has re really tried to do in, in the context of, of, of forest. People have tried to do that in, in savanna, where they are doing game, ran game ranching. But in the forest, high forest context, it's very difficult. So it never happened. And it's not that it's not possible, but it, that was already consider as something, no, we should protect the species. Uh, and, and we show in our, in our research that it is possible to manage some of the species. It is possible to have a, a sustainable hunting on the small, fast reproducing, resilient species, what, what we call the sort of the rat equivalence, but in fact it's anything from uh, one kilo to uh, 40 kilo, uh, small antelopes, uh, rats, a porcupine, uh, and other fast reproducing species. Pangolin are a bit different, especially they, they belong to this category, but they are slow reproducing, so they, they should be protected. But the interesting part is that this, this group of species represents already 70% of the catch. Most of the people, they don't go out in the forest to kill a gorilla. They go out in the forest to take some meat, and it's much more easier to handle a small antelopes than a, 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 an injured gorilla or to kill an elephant. You just need to have a, a few dollars. You can invest in a little bit of steel cable. You make a snare, and you can catch an animal. If you want to hunt a bigger animal, you need a gun, and uh, you, you need a, so. So it's, it's quite easy to enter the, the bushmeat value chain. It's uh, low, low investment, uh, high return, bring you some cash, allow to pay for the, the school of the kids, uh, allow to buy some cigarettes, some soap, so, so, some basic product. So it's something that is quite easy, and that's part of the, of the, the livelihood of the, the local people. And that's very important to understand also that it's a very gendered value chain. So men are hunting, women are selling and uh, cooking the product. And, and this plays a dis disproportionate role in, in, the, in the, the livelihood of women. And then you have also add to that the public health issue, the fact that you have all heard about the Ebola crisis. Uh, if you remove the, the, the few grams of bushmeat that the people eat in Madagascar, I mean, sort of, you increase the chance of anemia in children by 25%. Uh, there is a clear link in the Congo Basin, in the work we have just finished for, for, uh, with uh, the colleague from Imperial College, between availability of bushmeat, pressure, rate of stunting, and prevalence of Ebola. So there is a clear interlinkage that we need to understand better and then working on it. So how, how can we work on that? I think that we should really look at the bushmeat as a sort of a socio-economic problem more than a conservation problem. And we need to address reducing the, the demand. And we can reduce the demand in town. People in town have less the need to eat bushmeat than in a rural village. We can stop the demand in international. There is nobody who needs to eat bushmeat in Paris or Brussels. Sorry, we can reduce that. Uh, we can improve the sustainability of supply by managing the resource the fast reproducing species. And at the same time, we need to work on alternative proteins. But we know that the alternative protein solution is not for today, it's for maybe in 25 years from now. And it's linked to the fact that people are moving from rural area to town. That's, it's more and more in an urbanized world and more and more uh, uh, wilderness around. So it, it is where we are, and it, it is the sort of the the purpose of the work we do in, in, in the Bushmeat Research Initiative uh, in, um, in C4. And now we have work in the, in the Congo Basin, but we have also work in, in the Amazon countries. Uh, and we are starting something in Southeast Asia. And, and really the purpose is to change, to shift the paradigm from Bushmeat being a biodiversity issue to Bushmeat being a, a livelihood development issue. 
also a conservation one, that we can address through uh, uh, proper management and proper uh, multiple use management of tropical forest. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> so we'd like to uh, invite colleagues to uh, pose some questions or offer some comments. If I could ask you, when you do ask a question, to stand up and give your name. Thanks, Robert. I'm Lou Verschel. Um, and I, I'd just like to ask you, you talked a bit about this, the, the urban demand. And I'm just wondering, how much can the urban demand actually be a motor for creating value and, and using that value to create incentives for improved conservation or, or, or improved management? You know, if, if something is valued then, and people can earn a living off of it, won't there be more incentive to, 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 to conserve it and, and to, to manage it appropriately and more sustainably rather than, than cutting off the urban consumption and, and then having it just be a subsistence product? Again, okay, there, there are three elements in, uh, in the answer to your question, Louis. One is the fact that, first, urban people are eating 10 times less bushmeat per capita than rural people. So people moving to cities are the same, with the same population, you reduce the, the, the demand. Second, people in cities can pay more, are willing to pay for bushmeat. When, when they move into city, it becomes more like a luxury product instead of a basic product. So this is where it is important to have the issue of the, the bushmeat sector recognized as something which is formal, that is open and not criminal. As it is now, we cannot do what you suggest because everything is criminal. You are not supposed to hunt. You are not supposed to trade. You can only uh, hunt with the traditional purpose for your own consumption. It is not the case. So b before moving to this, I mean, giving a value to the, to the end product in the value chain, we need to have the enabling environment and we need to have the politics understanding that it is important to bring these things out of the criminal world to something that we can manage and, and keep protecting the species that need to be protected. I mean, sort of. But yes, I mean, that, that's one of the, the, the idea. I mean, so uh, controlling more the demand in town, uh, increasing the price in town so that it becomes a luxury product uh, and at the same time working on the whole value chain trying to make to bring it out of the criminality where it stands now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Peter Holmgren. Um, you started by saying that uh, you asked the question whether, why do we talk about bushmeat when we are dealing with forestry? To me, clearly, this is, this is part of forestry. And, and uh, at least when I studied forestry, hunting was a big part of the curriculum. So I think there's no doubt that the conservation values and the use values of, of bushmeat are inside the domain of forestry. But I have two boundary questions that I would like to, you to tease out on. Um, one is, to what extent are we talking about the forest? Do we also have bushmeat outside the forest? Maybe agro-bushmeat or whatever you might call that. Um, is, or or are, we, are we confining this to, to the forest ecosystem in any way? That's one. And the second is, uh, what about um, the wider uh, game hunting for food? Um, it's a very large part of the forest use in many, many countries around the world. And, and are, are we including all of that in the concept? And if so, if we, because if we do that, and we're talking about a very high proportion of the value of, of, the, of the forest use. So I'm, I'm curious about your views on those two. And just to conclude, I think it's excellent because this also shows how we enter the nutrition and health um, issues from, from a forestry angle. Thank you. First part of your question, I think, yes, it, it's a forest, but uh, the forest uh, with a broad sense, in a sense, a significant amount of the hunting is what we call garden hunting. It's people snaring animals that are uh, raiding their, their crops. So, and, and then, so it's, it's more like the, the forest landscape. So we are looking at the hunting question in the Congo Basin, uh, in, in, in the, the thing that is uh, defined as the guinea congolian rainforest area, but you have savanna inside, you have the, we, we are also looking at issue on, um, on uh, dry land and in savanna. So it's more, like, what do you do with wildlife uh, at the landscape scale in terms of managing and uh, extracting the resource. So it's not simply uh, located of within the forest. And, and a lot of the, 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 the most profitable hunting is happening in fallows anyway, more than in the, in, in, in the deep forest. But, but your, your 
second question, we haven't really looked at the bigger world uh, because it's a sort of it's a different story. In, in most places in, in, in developed country, um, uh, hunting is seldom happening because it is a food security or nutrition issue. It's, it's first something which is, can be cultural, uh, something that people like to do, people uh, make money out of it, something like that, but assuming that we stop hunting, nobody is going to die of hunger. So, but uh, that, that's something that other people are considering, but ourselves, we, we limit ourselves to the tropic and, and for this part of the, uh, on, on the issue of bushmeat. Our colleagues in Sirad are working on the uh, sport hunting issue, and, uh, but it, it's more related to uh, uh, the dry land area. Daniel. Daniel. Um, I learned and believe that the, the term bush meat came from the work in Africa. Um, as we learned that you are going also to work in Latin America, Southeast Asia. How do you anticipate the uh, terminology when this term is propagated to many different geographic locations uh, with regard to their belief, their culture, whether it's four-legged or flying meat or something? Thank you. Yeah. In fact, the, the term bush meat comes from the French viande de brousse, uh, which really is sort of a literal translation of meat from the bush. And uh, it's, it's widely recognized. We had some sort of endless discussion with the colleagues in FAO saying, should we use bush meat or wi wild meat? It's, it's, we use bush meat because people recognize its links to the issue of the bush meat crisis. And, uh, um, in terms of what is happening in Latin America, uh, in, in, the, in the Amazon mainly, it's more or less the same than what is happening in the Congo Basin except that in the Amazon, people are very likely uh, eating more fish than they are eating meat. Uh, so it's, it's really the, the major protein source is, is, is fish, but they do hunt for, for meat. And, so, and then when we talk to the, the, the people in, in uh, Spanish or Portuguese speaking country, they translate literally also uh, bush meat into uh, the equivalent to in Spanish or, or Portuguese. So it's not an issue. In terms of, the, and in, by bush meat we include anything that is more than 500 grams. So we have a tendency to stay away from the grubs and the insect, although they play an important role. But it's it's sort of a different dynamic, different issues. In, in Southeast Asia, is a different problem. Southeast Asia, most of the trade in wildlife is for medicinal purpose. There are some linked to people eating, but it's always with some sort of a background of oh, you are eating a turtle soup because it's good for your health, or you are eating the pangolin, but in fact you are mainly interested in the pangolin scales. scales. So the, we have a study that, that uh, look at the wildlife market uh, in, in, in the mainland Asia, uh, continental Southeast Asia, and it's, it's really about the, the medicinal trade. That, that's the main issue. And that makes it totally different from, from, from the, the, the two other, the, paleo, the um, Congo Basin and Amazon Basin. Dan? Um, Dan Cooney. Robert, two questions. What's the global trend in terms of the, whether bushmeat hunting is legal, illegal, banned or not? And secondly, are there examples of where there's been sort of empty forest syndrome and then communities through the legalization of, uh, and regulation of some, I assume, of, some, of bushmeat hunting where the biodiversity has come back? to sustainable levels? The trends, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that there is a sort of a global common trend, but the, the overall situation you have in, in many countries is that the, the regulatory framework is totally inadapted to the reality, as, and as such is not implemented. But you have forestry or wildlife laws and regulation in most of the country in the Congo Basin. They cannot be implemented. They have been developed by people coming from the north and then they give you hunting season where there is no meaning of any hunting season in this country or they say that you can only hunt with a, a cable that is made with a grass or something like that. That's, so it's not implementable. So, but, but as a result, everything is criminal. Or you can have a, 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 a license in Cameroon, but buying a, 
a license to trade bushmeat uh, cost you $800, which is beyond anybody uh, doing that. In, uh, in uh, Amazon Basin, I guess uh, Miguel will be uh, better to answer, but uh, the, the, the situation differs for each country, and even within a country like Brazil, it differs by state. So there is no global trend. Some people consider bushmeat in their statistics, some don't, some consider that you can hunt but you cannot trade, some consider that uh, you can only hunt for your own consumption, so it's, it's, it's a bit of a mess. Overall, the, the legislative framework is totally inadapted to managing the resource. The second question, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, from the top of my mind, uh, I can't tell you if there is a place that was completely uh, empty of animal that le be left alone, the animal came back. We have anecdotal evidence that when you disturb, uh, like after a uh, logging operation, the animal go away. A few years later, they come back in bigger number because they like the differentiated vegetation. You have uh, some open area with grass, you have some closed area. But in terms of the, what is happening with the empty forest syndrome is generally linked to a high level of population and pressure and people, the population stays there. Well, what is mostly happening is that it's not the animal that come back, it's the forest that disappear to, do, to produce something else. Uh, Kieran Nasher, thanks. Uh, thanks, Robert. You were talking at the beginning part of your talk about how there's management and ranching of wild animals in savannah, but not so much in forests, and I was wondering if if uh, you knew anything or any updates about what was going on with Dagmar Werner's project on iguana conservation in Central America, where she was trying a model of, of ranching iguanas sort of in semi-captivity, so they would be, the eggs would be on a farm, and then, you know, once they got to a certain size, they would be released in, in, in the forest or on the edge of the forest. And do you know of any other studies that, you know, that would be implementable or that would be interesting to look at for bushmeat? There have been a few uh, tentatives of uh, breeding uh, small rodents, uh, especially uh, what, what they call the, the brush-tailed porcupine, which is one of the, the most hunted species. Uh, the problem is that it doesn't make economic sense in, in, in many cases. And then uh, the, the, the most blatant example was that I was in a conference of, in Brussels about bushmeat, about food security in the DRC, and and we had this session on, on wildlife, and you had a very dignified Belgian professor that will say, oh, presenting a breeding of Olakod, this uh, brush tail porcupine, uh, in the area in, of Kisangani. Uh, and they say, yeah, you should do that. Is it, this is how you can do it. Uh, you have to give this type of uh, food to the animal, and then we grow by so many grams per day. And, uh, and then something like 10 minutes later, we had a, a, a Congolese PhD student who just finished his PhD on the, the damage to uh, crops by wildlife. And uh, his conclusion was that oh, every year the, the, the farmer in Kisangani, they lost $7 million equivalent of maize and rice because of the brush tail porcupine. So you can see that when you go to the people and you say you should breed this animal that is just destroying their culture, the message doesn't come very well. I mean, they better buy a gun and shoot the things. Uh, so it could work in a context like uh, Kinshasa, where you have a 10 million person uh, capital city that is surrounded by no forest, nothing is left. So people, it would make sense economically in Kinshasa to breed some animals and sell to the people. But in fact, it, it's much more efficient to work with the animals we know, like pigs, chicken, than, than to, to breed uh, these, these rodents. So when it makes economic sense, it's much more easier to use the, the domestic animal we know. And in many cases, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Totally different situation in the game ranching uh, business uh, in, in, in the open savannah. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I think you more or less responded with the, with the previous question. I was wondering because you mentioned the traditional opposition between conservation promoted by the north and you know, extraction by the south. But, I mean, the whole point of sustainability, you know, is to have a reconcile 
both um, uh, issues. So I was wondering whether you could observe some local attempts uh, with collective action for regulation in order to make it more sustainable because people are, I guess, starting to face the consequences of overproduction. There are some things in, uh, in Latin America because the civil society is much more advanced than in the Congo Basin. Uh, for the case of the Congo Basin, that's the problem we are facing. The, the North see it as a conservation problem. The people in the Congo Basin, they don't see it as a problem at all. So for them, there is nothing to address. If you go and, and you are invited to eat at the, by some of the ministers in charge of the environment, they will serve you bushmeat. For them, this, there is no social stigma associated. There is no problem associated with bushmeat because they only see that as presented as a conservation problem. When you start to talk to them and you, you tell them, okay, that you know that the bushmeat informal sector is the size of the whole agricultural sector of your country, then, then it starts to be. Then we tell them, and you know how many millions of uh, CFA francs you could get back into the state coffin simply by managing the resource instead of making it criminal and only uh, breeding corruption. But uh, we, we are not, uh, that's part of the thing that we are doing in the Congo Basin is trying to raise the issue so that people start discussing and realize that there is a problem. Then you can talk about collective action to address the issue. But uh, as of today, the, this has, didn't work. Aaron, and this, uh, this is the last question. Aaron Russell. Um, thank you for your presentation. I, I would agree that the problem to me seems to be two different problems. One is with regard to conservation of biodiversity in rural areas in terms of rural consumption patterns. And the other one is very different with regards to urban consumption. But urban consumers, they would still prefer to have bushmeat if they had the choice. And the alternative that they're going to is to poultry and beef. And from you know, all of our research, that, that typically results in negative consequences for the global climate and um, you know, water consumption and all of that. Is that should, I, maybe that, that, that is a northern kind of value that's particular, that, that only some northerners are, are considering. But is that something that is worth pursuing as a, as a, as a rationale for, folk, for, for increasing the amount of uh, sustainably raised bushmeat or fish, I would like to say, uh, for urban consumption. And linking to that, I mean, like you said, fish is the main source of pro protein consumed in, you know, in a lot of the Congo Basin. Um, and there's, there's, should we be focusing, should we be focusing on, on well, obviously that's the World Fish Center's work, um, but <laughs> there, that is, that there's a lot of flooded forest that, that produces all that fish. And um, it has it has a direct impact also on wildlife consumption. Um, so should should we be looking at fish? And also like the the Mekong, we don't we don't, we can't just dis, we can't just say oh and we're you know talking about grubs as if it's not a significant thing. That is grubs and crustaceans and snails and frogs are pri one of the primary sources of protein <laughs> in some of the Mekong. Um, should we be discussing? Should we kind of obviously? WWF and all these other organizations, they, they focus on habitats for large charismatic species. But like you say, the main thing that people are after are the, the, the caterpillars and the, uh, the, a lot of the, and the fish. And should we be focusing more on that? The first part of, the, of your question about the, um, the urban demand, it's, it's I, 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 would, I was thinking like you, uh, a few years ago, it, it's a bit more complicated. I mean, you have in some urban certain big cities where bushmeat is a luxury product, typically Libreville in Gabon, where um, they will buy a, a, a leg of uh, Dwicker for Christmas. Or something. But most of the time, they will eat chicken or fish. And uh, what, what, is, what we see in, uh, in, uh, in the area of the Tree Frontier area in the Colombia, uh, Peru and um, um, Brazil, uh, it's in fact that there is a, a nutrition transition where people are not buying bush meat anymore, only a few people. What they buy is frozen chicken from Brazil because it's cheaper. And in Kisangani, people buy bush meat because it's cheaper. And when there is caterpillar, caterpillar are cheaper than bush meat, they buy caterpillar. So, 
there is a test element, but the test element is the, vanishes in, in front of the economic element. If you provide them with something that is cheaper, a source of, of protein, they will buy this one. And from time to time, they will have a luxury to buy something like that. The, the, so that's something. About the fish, uh, I fully agree with you, but nobody is working on the fish. I've asked the colleagues of the World Fish Center, do, does anybody work on the, on the freshwater fish? And no. So yes, that, that's a big, a big black box because a lot of the conservation uh, agency, they will tell you, oh, you should stop hunting and eat fish. My feeling and the anecdotal evidence is that fish stocks are probably more depleted than even the, the, the bush meat, the terrestrial animal stocks. So we cannot just stop and move to fish. I mean, fish are already over harvested, but we, are, we know very little about that. You are in Makoku in Gabon, you have a sort of a 900 meter wide river that is flowing across the city. And you go, you buy the fish, the fish is coming from 500 kilometers. So that gives you an idea of the state of the river. So yes, yes, we should do that. And something that we consider, but of course you are always limited by the human or financial resources you have. And the fact that there is very, very little on fish. The USN just published a, uh, an atlas of the conservation and endangered uh, uh, aquatic wildlife in the Congo Basin, but that's the first sort of answer. But, and there is nothing about the management. If you take the FAO statistics, they will tell you that people in, in DRC eat five kilo of fish per year, which is ridiculous. Well, thank you, Robert. Oh, sorry, uh, Peter, sorry. your last question? Yeah, sorry to, sorry to ask again, Peter Hornby. Um, I want to relate this work to the CJR. Uh, two questions. One is, how does this work in terms of food and nutrition sit within the CDIR's mission for food and nutrition security? What's the perception? What's the, uh, do we have to fight for this space, etc.? And secondly, uh, given that we are moving towards uh, a new phase of CRPs and flagships, etc., etc., is there space for a flagship on wild food for nutrition and health or something like that? Well, the first uh, part of the question is very easy. It sits here and uh, with ME over there. So it, definitely not in F or NH. They don't work at all on these topics. We, we, we discuss with them. They recognize that there is an interest. But uh, this is not their, their concern. Uh, on the second question, yes, we, we are discussing, uh, uh, and especially with, with, with colleagues in, in various centers, on this issue of what is a badly... Uh, called nutrition sensitive landscape, which is in fact, it's something that considers also all the elements brought by wild food in the livelihood, uh, food security and nutrition and local people, and not simply the, the sort of the domestic farming elements. So, and, and I guess it's definitely something that could be a, a, a flagship and that, that could be of great importance. I mean, so all the data we have show that between, Anything between uh, 10 to 60% uh, of the protein intake comes from uh, wild food, from, uh, from wild meat. Uh, between uh, 15 and 100% uh, of the, the food security is mainly achieved by wild products. Uh, the significant element of the livelihood is also linked to selling this product to get cash to buy food. Uh, and all these elements are totally ignored in the sort of the current context where in fact you have farmers doing farming and eating and selling domestic animals. Well, no, not. There are something else and this is something that we can work with. Robert, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. Thanks everyone for the great discussion. Thank you.